Okay, so let me tell you a little about what is at the table here. I'm going to tell you what they are, let you come get them, and then I'll tell you a little bit about each of them. So uh, each of the teas has a little cup in front of them, and in the cup is some loose leaf tea. So you can see what it looks like. You can, you know, smell it. You can, you know, put it in your ear, whatever you want to do. So um, each of the cups has tea in it. And I have a black tea, a green tea, and two herbal teas. So uh, just so you know, herbal tea is not actually tea. There's only one type of plant that is actually tea. It's the Camellia sinensis plant. Everything that is not that is not tea. But the good thing is neither of these have caffeine. So there's rooibos, which is an African uh, bush. Rooibos means red bush. It's an African bush that brews a very kind of rich, very flavorful infusion, which is what you call an herbal tea, an herbal infusion, since it's not actually a tea. And then the one next to it, or I'm sorry, the smaller one is the rooibos. The bigger one, the glass pot, is uh, a tea that I got in Munich, Germany uh, from this place called Schubex. And uh, there's this guy in Munich that owns like a chocolate shop, a restaurant, a tea shop. If you've ever been to Munich, there's a place in the center of downtown that's kind of like the happening place. It's like the ritzy part of town. And this guy owns like a quarter of that little city center. And uh, this is his most popular tea. It's called Munich's favorite tea in, the, you know, in German. But, uh, but it's actually an herbal infusion. It's kind of mint and fruit and floral. It's a very interesting blend. It's got a lot of flavor, uh, but it's just kind of a, a blend of um, herbal stuff. So you've got the rooibos, you've got Munich's favorite tea, and then this one is actually a jasmine green tea, which is very common kind of green tea. Uh, and this one is a black tea that's called um, Yixing Kongu. And Yixing <coughs> is uh, known for a particular kind of clay that comes out of the Yixing region of China that they make these little teapots with called Yixing pots. If you've ever seen a little teapot that looks like it would only brew one cup uh, it's, it actually will only brew. They make them from four ounces on up to about 12 ounces. And uh, that particular kind of clay called Yixing clay comes out of this region. Uh, and the cool thing about the pots is you only brew one kind of tea for the entire life of the pot because they start to take on the flavor of the tea that you brew. And so someone will use the same pot for 10 years and then you know their tea tastes very unique, very flavorful because they've used one high quality tea for 10 years or even longer. And you, you'll actually see some of these pots going on eBay for hundreds of dollars because they're old and because some of them have the same high quality tea brewed in, brewed in them for years. I don't know how you would verify that. Somebody could be brewing Lipton in it for 20 <laughs> years and then selling it to you for a few hundred dollars. But I actually, I've got several. I've got one that I only brew Yunnan from China in, black Yunnan. I've got one that I brew black Kimun in. I've got one that I uh, brew uh, green Oolong in. And, uh, and then I've got one, oh, and one that I only brew Pu'er in, which is a, an aged fermented tea that some of you will hate, probably a lot of you, and then some of you might actually like. Then we'll save that for the last class of Pu'er tea. Um, but my Kimun, little Kimun Yixing pot, I've only brewed high quality Kimun in for the entire life of the pot. And so it actually has a very unique flavor. It's starting to get a very unique scent. So we'll talk more about all that. So uh, black tea, green tea, both of these are decaf on the end here, um, and they are rooibos from Africa and a uh, kind of that mixed tea from Munich, Germany. So come up and pick a tea, and I'll tell you more about all of them as we get going here. And we'll brew as much as we need to. You can try all four if you want to. Uh, feel free to get a half cup and come back. You can, however much you want, you can have. Um, and again, the sign-in sheet is... At the front here, if you didn't sign in, it's $15. If you can't pay tonight, you can pay next week, no problem. Just be sure to let us know, be sure to sign in. Oh, and I didn't tell you this, there is sugar and there is cream at the table. Um, you can do whatever you want, but typically black tea or a dark tea like this rooibos is something people would use cream in. Typically for like a green tea or a light herbal tea, you wouldn't use cream in, but it's totally up to you. You can try whatever you want. Some herbal teas, cream will actually curdle in whenever you use it. It's just the chemical makeup curdles cream, but uh, feel free to try whatever you want. Good.
You certainly can, and I'm, I actually have bought teacups as well, but I needed to see how many people came before I finished buying everything. So you'll get a teacup at the end of the class. That is, it's, yeah, it's not all natural sugar, so it's like raw sugar. Yeah, you can try, you can try all of these tonight, absolutely. Come back and we'll brew more. Which one did you do? Try first. Thank you. This one is a jasmine green tea. Um, how do you know how many leaves? Typically, it's about a teaspoon per ounce of tea. Some vary, and it depends on the strength you like it. I brewed all these about medium strength. Those are my very good ones. About a teaspoon per ounce of tea. The temperature and brewing time varies dramatically. We'll talk about that in a minute. So you've been studying teas for how long, Justin? A long time. I know yeah. more about tea than is necessary. I can tell you that. So let me talk a little bit about the different teas. Uh, there are five kinds of tea and only five kinds of true tea. There is uh, white tea, green tea, oolong tea, black tea, and pu'er. And all of these are from Camellia sinensis, the tea plant. The only difference in any tea is the uh, elevation, the climate, the soil, it's the environmental factors that make the difference from one tea to the next. And then, of course, there's lots of flavored teas. There's a billion, gazillion different flavors of teas. Uh, most of the teas that we'll have here are what they call straight teas or pure teas. They're not flavored. I like some flavored teas, but I really like just straight teas because there's so many differences in the flavors just because of the different soil that they're, that they're picked in. And of course the processing is what makes it, you know, a black tea versus a white tea, but it's all the same plant. Uh, but for instance, this is a black tea from China. It's from Yixing, China. Most black China teas will have uh, flavors in the range of like, say chocolate or honey, or sometimes a smoky flavor, or sometimes even leather or tobacco. It's kind of like, you know, you read the description of the flavor of wine, and it's like, how in the world do they get this? But they're, they're kind of struggling to describe the nuance of flavor that you get on different parts of your tongue. And, you know, you get a little hint of this and a little hint of that. It's the same with tea. This is actually a pretty expensive tea. I think it's uh, probably close to $100 a pound, this particular Yixing tea. But pound for pound, coffee and tea are very different. A pound of coffee, you know, I don't know, but you might get 30 cups of coffee, 40 cups of coffee. A pound of tea, you can get 160 to 300 cups, just depending on how you brew it. Um, tea is much more potent than coffee. Um, I heard a few of you talking about caffeine and, you know, what level of caffeine does different kinds of tea have. And believe it or not, all tea has exactly the same amount of caffeine. However, there's an port important however. Uh, different teas are brewed at different temperatures and for different lengths of time. And if you brew, you know, for instance, a green tea the same way you brew a black tea, then it's going to be disgusting. 
And one reason that a lot of people really want to like green tea, but if they're honest with themselves, they kind of hate it, is because they brew it wrong. If you brew green tea with boiling water, it's going to be bitter and astringent. Astringent is that quality that leaves your tongue feeling funny after you drink tea. Uh, green tea is supposed to be brewed, say, anywhere from 180 degrees up to maybe 190, 195, which is significantly uh, cooler than boiling water, which is 212 <coughs> degrees. So if you're going to brew green tea, if you boil your water and then let it sit uncovered for about five minutes, it'll cool down to about 190 or 180, which is about what you want to use to boil green tea. Uh, the other way to do it is if you boil in something that you can see, uh, the Chinese have a method of boiling water where they know the temperature based on the size of the bubbles. There's shrimp eyes and then there's like lizard eyes and then frog eyes and the bigger the bubble, the hotter the water is. And whenever you have a little shrimp eye sized bubble, you're at the temperature for green tea. And so, the, you know, the cooler temperature of water uh, is how you brew green tea. And you only want to brew green tea for two to three minutes. If you brew it for five minutes, like black tea, then it's going to get bitter or it's going to be astringent. I see people sometimes leaving a tea bag in green tea and bless their heart, they don't know that green tea doesn't taste right if you leave your tea bag in. It's not, it's not made to be brewed at that high of a level. It gets past the, there's an optimal temperature for releasing all of the antioxidants and all of the flavonoids and all the stuff that's supposed to come out of tea. And based on how it's processed, it's more or less delicate. And the, the more delicate it is, the cooler the temperature and the less time you want to brew it at. So the reason I said all tea has the same amount of caffeine is because if you brew green tea at a 212 degrees for five minutes, it's going to have the same amount of caffeine as black tea that's brewed at 212 for five minutes. But the difference is green tea is supposed to be brewed a lot cooler at a shorter amount of time. So if you brew green tea properly, it's going to have about 15 to 20 milligrams of caffeine, which is about one fifth of the same amount of coffee. So eight ounces of you know, normal strength coffee is 100 milligrams of caffeine, but green tea brewed properly, eight ounces is about 15 to 20. So it's far less caffeine if you brew it right. Black tea is gonna have about 40 or 50 milligrams because you brew it at 212 for five minutes. And so it's got about half the amount of caffeine of coffee. The reason I personally like the caffeine of tea better is because coffee, it, your, your caffeine is, it's diffused immediately when you drink it. So you get a caffeine rush and then you crash. But with tea, it's actually slowly released over time. It's slowly kind of diffused in your body over time. And so you don't get the kind of caffeine rush and crash, but you get kind of a steady level of energy throughout the day. It diffuses over, you know, six or eight hours or maybe four to six hours. So, you know, I personally like that. Um, there's, I'm trying not to give everything I got about tea in the first night, but there's so much to know about tea. Uh, what time is it? That will that will cause me to bridle myself in talking about tea. 7.34. 7.34, good, so we still got plenty of time. Um, so that's just kind of a, a little about tea in general. The caffeine level depends on how hot you brew it and how long you brew it. Um, I'll talk about the different kinds of tea for a minute. Uh, white tea is... It's the least processed tea. They basically pick it and they let it dry and they don't do anything to it. And so it's the you know, most pure tea, so to speak, is the least processed. White tea you also brew at a lower temperature for less amount of time, similar to green tea. And it's, you know, they just basically pick it and they'll, they'll let it dry. The next step up would be green tea. Green tea is uh, they begin to let it oxidize, but they only let it oxidize just enough to bring out that really bright green color. Uh, if you were to go out in, you know, the whatever, out here to this tree and pick a leaf, if you were to take the leaf and just kind of barely rough it up in your hand, if you come back in a couple minutes, everywhere that the creases are are going to turn bright green. But if you leave that same leaf, or if you, you know, if you were to take leaves and compost them where they get kind of roughed up a little and they sit, then they'll turn dark brown. If you were to kind of rough up that leaf and you know, just leave it somewhere, you'd come back in a day or two and it's gonna turn brown. It's the same with tea. If they just barely oxidize it a little bit, they rough it up so that the waxy coating on the leaf breaks and the tea kind of start, the air kind of hits the insides and it starts to oxidize. 
uh, a green tea, they will stop it from oxidizing any further by applying heat to it. So they might uh, dry it, they, uh, they might steam it, they might um, put it in, they have these big like kind of baking machines that they'll put it in. So they'll apply heat to stop the oxidization to where it's that very bright green. So green tea that's brewed properly actually has a flavor, it sounds like the word vegetable because it's kind of like vegetable. It has a vegetal taste, which means it tastes kind of green and kind of sweet is the way that green tea should taste if it's brewed correctly. The next step up is gonna be oolong tea. Oolong is right in between green tea and black tea. Uh, it's, they let it oxidize a little more. Uh, they don't let it fully oxidize like black tea, but they kind of you know, mid-level oxidize it. And there's green oolong and brown oolong. Uh, brown oolong is, uh, they kind of uh, roast it, and so it actually turns brown and it tastes kind of roasted. It tastes kind of brown or you know cooked. Uh, green <coughs> oolong is, it kind of tastes like green tea, but a lot of the time there's more of a floral taste. There's a little bit of a more rich taste. It's not so much vegetal as it is floral. And that's how a green oolong will typically taste. We'll try some of those. We're gonna try all of these different kinds of tea as the, as the time goes on. And we will try some flavored teas as well, but just not a lot. Um, so the next step up from oolong is black tea. Black tea, they fully oxidize it and it gets completely black or you know the leaves turn completely brown. Um, and to me, I've been most into uh, black tea because I was a coffee drinker before I started drinking tea. And black tea is closest to coffee out of all the different kinds of tea. And there are some kinds of black tea that are very similar to coffee in my opinion. Now, they're very similar, that's kind of apples to oranges, but there's some that are as close to coffee as you can get in a tea. Um, and so black tea though, I don't know if you noticed in this cup, this tea, the leaves are very curly. If you pick up an individual tea, it's kind of a long tea leaf. It's very curly and there's like some orange and brown colors mixed in with that dark brown color. That's typically a sign of a quality tea. If you're getting a whole tea leaf like that, and if there's some kind of color variation in there, that's usually a sign of good tea. A sign of cheap tea is like a Lipton tea bag. You shake it and it looks like coffee grounds in there. It's all broken up. Just kind of a you know trade secret is that tea bags typically are the shake that's left over from processing good quality tea. <coughs> that's not always the case. Some companies like Lipton, all they make is low quality tea. So they just cut everything up but a lot of tea bags, it's the, it's the stuff that falls off of tea whenever it's being processed. And again, that's general terms because big tea companies, that's all they make is tea bag tea and they just chop up and destroy all of their tea. But good quality tea, you're gonna be able to see kind of a whole tea leaf uh, and black teas in particular, a lot of kind of the higher end black teas have a lot of orange or gold. There's a, 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 um, a tea called Yunnan Pure Gold that's very expensive, 100 to $200 a pound for the really good stuff. Uh, that is, has a ton of gold in it. I mean, you look at it and it's literally like orange and gold and brown. And so there's a lot of color distinctives in good quality black tea. Um, let's see, anything else on, oh yeah, and the last tea, the, uh, the one that we'll save for last is Pu'er. And this is a tea that is fully oxidized and then it is fermented and aged. And some of it is aged for decades. And it's kind of like fine wine in that the older it is, the more expensive it is. And some of it is like $1,000 a pound. Good. I mean, some of it is very expensive, yes. Did you spell that? I didn't understand. Yeah, there's all kinds of different spellings uh, because it's, it's a phonetic spelling of a Chinese or Japanese word. But uh, P-U-E-R-H is one way that it's often spelled. Did I do that right? Yeah, that's right. Sometimes there's a hyphen in there. Sometimes it's P-U hyphen E-R-H. I've seen various ways of spelling it. Sometimes there's no H at the end, it's only the R. Uh, but it's a, it's a tea that you really love it or hate it. Some of it uh, tastes very kind of woodsy, very earthy, kind of like cedar, or some of it is kind of has sort of a dirt flavor or like a mushroom flavor. And some of it is all the way to like you know, gym socks, like yeah. nastiness. <laughs> and especially like the cheap pu'er that you can buy from China on eBay for really, really cheap. Some of that is really bad. And I'll bring some of that in for you to try too, just so you can experience the gamut. 
Uh, and some of it, though, is actually, I personally really like it. Some of it is very earthy. Um, they sometimes call pu'er skinny tea because it's, if you drink a lot of it, it really helps the digestion and it's, it actually will help you to lose weight. Uh, Tivana used to sell some tea called, that they would call skinny tea. They had different flavors and it's basically just pu'er tea mixed with herbal tea. Uh, so supposedly it can help you to lose weight. Uh, let's see here. So uh, traditionally in a, like a Chinese tea tasting, there's a particular way that you would do a tea tasting, and we're going to go around the room and do a tea tasting. Uh, there are tea masters that literally studied for years to become a tea master uh, in China and maybe in other Asian countries, but they call them a gong fu master. It's actually another variation of the word kung fu, which means great skill. And there are great skilled tea masters called gong fu tea masters that study how to brew the various kinds of tea, and some of them might specialize in pu'er or specialize in black tea or whatever. Um, and they will uh, train for years, and like whenever they're brewing tea, they don't ever time it or anything. They just know exactly how long, just instinctively, internally, they know how long you know it's been and, and when do you take the tea leaves out and all that. And um, Oh, so uh, if you were to go to a true tea tasting with a gong fu master, then there's several things that you would do. Uh, first of all, he wouldn't be brewing in pots like this. He would be brewing in probably a yixing pot like I talked about before, or there's other little small brewing cups with a lid that you <laughs> brew and pour out little amounts at a time. Uh, and so he would brew cycles of tea. He would put a whole lot of tea into a little yixing pot or a little cup, and he would brew it the first round probably for just like you know 10 seconds and then he would pour it off and that's called a wash that just they say it wakes up the tea and it enlivens the tea and then he would pour again and probably brew it for like 30 seconds and there's a lot of tea in this little pot and then he would pour out a little ounce or so for each of us to try and we would try the tea but but here's how you would do it you would first uh, take the tea and kind of smell it uh, you would also take the dry leaves like this and you would look at the, the color of the tea. You might even touch it and feel it. And then you would actually look at the brewed tea leaves and the brewed tea leaves would be passed around. Everyone would, you know, touch it and smell it. It's very involved. Think of like a wine tasting if you've ever been to a wine tasting. And then uh, everyone would sip the tea and you would sip it like you do wine. You want to aerate the fluid whenever you sip it. So you kind of take it and either gargle it or go, you know, kind of get the air in it. Uh, and then everyone will comment on the tea. And so everyone would take a sip of the tea and then they would say, you know, it reminds me of autumn in the Adirondack Mountains or, you know, reminds me of fishing with my grandfather. Or it reminds me of peaches or, you know, reminds me of a cedar tree or whatever, you know, strawberries. Even if it's a black tea that has nothing to do with strawberries. And you just kind of say whatever comes to mind when you taste the tea. And so for the fun of it, we're going to have a tea tasting in here. So whatever tea you got, we're each going to go around and make a comment about the tea. And it's just kind of whatever you think of whenever you taste the tea. You can either be serious or ridiculous. It's totally up to you. And so uh, we'll go ahead and start with Tom here. Tell us what tea you got and, you know, give us a comment on the tea. You can say one word or several sentences, whatever you want. I got this mild tea here. I'm not sure what, what it's called. Green tea. The green tea? Mm -hmm. Yep, so that is a jasmine green tea. Oh, it, well, it was good I, as far as, uh, as, as, far, as, far as uh, some special uh, thing to say about it. Uh, I, I just liked it. It was good. I, I'm, not okay. tea, I'm not a tea drinker. No, that's that's and, good. Uh, that's it, appropriate. It, it had a... It had a um, like a, a soda flavor to it. It was like real, real, real easy to drink. Sweet. Awesome. Okay, good. All right, go for it. <laughs> well, then we'll go over here. Then. Um, I had the, the jasmine green tea and it was kind of a fruity. Okay. Very good. Kind of fruity, awesome. You know, it's actually, they, uh, they flavor it with actual jasmine flowers. So, Mary? I had the same. Mm -hmm. and Smooth. Okay. Awesome. I had the Munich, and it was real minty. Uh huh. Like it. It's got a couple different kinds of mint in it. I had the jasmine green tea, mm -hmm. and I like the uh, floral, mm -hmm. floral based floral elements to it. Cool. I had first. I had the one at the end. Mm -hmm. The rooibos. Yeah, I yeah. liked it. I'm still trying to build a vocabulary here. 
Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> a tasteful cabler. And this one I like, too. Uh-huh. And, I, and it's, there is something about it. I can't place it yet. Mm-hmm. But it's different than that one. Yeah. So yeah, this one commonly, uh, they'll serve at, like, Chinese restaurants and stuff. Sometimes they'll even do a long tea. Uh, let's actually pause the recording and then we'll pick back up after the tea tasting. So, and Ricard, you are next after you pause it. All right, so uh, tonight was very foundational in that we just talked about the different kinds of tea. Uh, it's sort of the one thing that I emphasized about the difference between these and those is that these are actually tea and those are not actually tea. So if it's not Camellia sinensis, it's not tea. It's just kind of foundational. Now, uh, Theology, you know, we're, we're talking about both tea and theology, and some nights will be a little different in that we'll actually be taking a tea and pairing it with a theologian. But tonight is very general and very basic and very foundational, just kind of laying out like what is tea, how do you brew it, those kind of things. And in the same way, we're going to talk just very basic about theology. Uh, often people consider Paul to be the first theologian. They consider him to be almost uh, that he was almost inventing something whenever he began to do the kind of what we call didactic writing that is in Romans or some of Ephesians and some of several of his letters that are very heavy in teaching. And the word didactic means teaching. It's the same word that doctrine comes from. Uh, in, the, in the scriptures, there is a word uh, didache in the Greek, which is often translated as doctrine. There's also a, an ancient uh, an ancient writing called the Didache or the Didache, if any of you have ever heard of that. It was first century writing before the scriptures were even compiled. They basically, they, they took the teachings of the apostles and the word Didache or Didache, didache means the teaching. And they compiled all the teachings as much as they had of the apostles and Jesus into this one little document and so from town to town, they could have this document, even though the New Testament wasn't compiled for a very long time after that. And they could have the basic teachings on baptism and salvation and some of the very basics on Christian ethics and that kind of thing. Some of the Sermon on the Mount and that kind of thing. And so uh, Paul was very didactic in a lot of his writings. He, he began writing in a way that hadn't really been done before. There's nothing like Romans in the Old Testament. You know, there's not that kind of line upon line, very theological, very doctrinal writing like you find in the book of Romans anywhere else. Uh, and so many consider him to kind of be the first theologian, and many consider uh, a lot of his writings to be very seminal in the entire field of theology. Uh, theology, the word theology, theos logos, means words about God or God words, words and thoughts about God. So in the, the most, you know, basic uh, form, theology is what kinds of words and thoughts about God are moving inside of you. Everyone is a theologian. Everyone has theology. Every person is a theologian because everyone has thoughts about God. Even an atheist has a theology operating inside of him. It's just a false theology. So the question is not, you know, do we have theology? Do we like theology? You know, are we into theology? The question is, is the theology that is operating inside of us good theology or bad theology? Because we all have theology operating inside of us. It's, uh, it's kind of what I would call our operative theology. There is theology that, that shapes and guides our entire lives. You know, our thoughts about God and whatever our answer to the question, how does God feel about me? What does God think about me? Whatever our answer to that question is will largely determine 
what our day-to-day -day life and experience is like and ultimately the outcome of our entire life. Our beliefs about God ultimately will end up leading us to our final destination, be that good or bad. And so it's very important that we have right thoughts about God. I've, if you've heard me preach on Sundays, I've quoted this a lot, especially the past year. There's a couple quotes by A.W. Tozer that I think are just very important. One of them, he says that the most important thing about a person is what comes to their mind when they think about God. The most important thing about a person is what comes to their mind when they think about God. Because their thoughts about God will determine things such as their own you know, self-worth. You know, do they like themselves? Do they not? Uh, you know, it'll determine things like, do they feel like they're actually going to have a positive outcome in their life or do they feel like everything is hopeless? You know, do they feel as though God is on their side and God really cares and God is with them or do they feel as though, you know, God is more or less uninvolved or even, you know, antagonistic towards them? So the most important thing about us is what comes into our mind when we think about God. The other quote from Tozer is, uh, the man who comes to right belief about God is relieved of 10,000 temporal problems. Whenever we come to right belief about God, we are relieved of 10,000 temporal problems. So many earthly issues just fall away whenever we get a right view of who God really is. Whenever we understand that we are dealing with, that we are relating to a God who is completely omnipotent, he is absolutely all-powerful. He's completely all-knowing, which means he absolutely knows everything. He understands everything way better than we do. He knows what's best for us. He knows our desires. He knows what he made us for. Therefore, he knows what it, what it would take in our own lives for us to be fully fulfilled and actualized and actually walk in the thing that makes us feel most alive. He knows all of that, and he's also good. He's gracious and he's compassionate and he knows the thoughts that he has towards us. They're thought, thoughts for our good to give us a future and a hope. So he's an omnipotent God. He's an omniscient God. He's also an om omnipresent God, which means he's always with us. So he's all powerful. He knows what's best. He, he wants to actually do good for us and he's with us all the time that he's ever present. He'll never leave us or forsake us. He's always with us, even to the ends of the earth. I mean, that if we really believed that, like if we believed it in an experiential way where it actually shaped our day-to-day -day lives and we actually walked in the kind of faith that, that is worthy of the kind of God that we actually live for, then I think our lives, many of our lives would be radically different, including my own. If day by day I was walking in revelation and concrete faith and all of those true facts about God, then, you know, I think our lives would just be radically different. We would certainly be relieved of 10,000 temporal problems. And the times in my life, whenever I feel as though I'm walking in the greatest amount of peace and joy, and I'm walking in the greatest amount of, uh, you know, just confidence in the outcome of my life is whenever I'm walking in revelation of who God really is. If we understand who he really is, if we have a proper theos logos, a proper understanding of who God really is, then it just changes everything. Um, Paul, in his writings, Romans is the one that comes to mind usually because it's the most kind of theological out of all of his writings, but really all of his letters, uh, you know, the, the letters to the churches and even the ones to individuals, they're, they're full of truth about who God is and who we are that will radically change our lives. You know, uh, he's the one who tells us things like God loves us and nothing can separate us from the love of God. He's the one who tells us that, uh, that God is sovereign and that God is all powerful and that God is trustworthy. That whenever we're considering who God really is, he's a God that we can actually trust for things like our provision. He provides for all of our needs according to his riches and glory. We can actually trust him for things like our healing because he gives gifts to men. He gives gifts such as the gift of healing and the gift of miracles. You know, we can trust God uh, because of who he is. 
We also get things like ecclesiology from Paul that tells us what the church and the body of Christ are like. You know, he talks about the body of Christ. He talks about the bride of Christ. He talks about us as the family of God. Um, we just get all of these kind of categories of understanding about who God is and who we are uh, that we don't really get from anywhere else. Um, the New Testament in general is much more theological than the Old Testament is. The Old Testament is largely narrative and prophecy That's, and, you know, wisdom and poetry literature like Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. But there's a lot of narrative that tells us the true history of God and how he made everything and how he called the people for himself. And there's a lot of prophecy that's telling us about you know, things like the fall of Jerusalem and the captivity and the return, which is all a prophetic picture, I think, of the end of the age. And there's prophecy about the first coming of Jesus and about the salvation that would come in the new covenant. And there's a lot of prophecy about what would happen at the second coming of Jesus. And so there's a lot of prophecy and there's a lot of narrative, tons of narrative, you know, the Pentateuch, the uh, Kings and Chronicles and all of those books and tons of narrative. But whenever you get to the New Testament, you start to get a theology that if, if you if you could really think of it as in the same way my computer here has an operating system and the, the software that is on the hardware of my computer is what actually programs it to be able to do the things that it can do, the New Testament gives us the software or the theology that enables our hardware ourselves to actually run and operate. Um, the Old Testament does do that somewhat, but the New Testament, you know, by and large is much more theological. One of the places in the New Testament that is very theological and that really gives us a great understanding of the New Covenant is the book of Hebrews. You know, I, I, I like to say if you love Jesus, you'll love Hebrews because Hebrews gives us uh, really a picture of Jesus like nowhere else. The, the summary of the book of Hebrews is Jesus is better than. In the very beginning, it's Jesus is better than the angels. Then Jesus is better than the law of Moses. Jesus is better than the tabernacle. He's better than the temple. He's better than the high priest. He's better than the sacrificial system. Jesus is better than everything else. So it gives us a Christology, which is a theology of who Jesus is, probably like nowhere else does. Colossians would be a close second. Uh, the book of Colossians is another one of those. If you love Jesus, you'll love Colossians. Uh, Bobby Connor was recently here. He said that God was releasing in this season a revelation of the glorified, exalted Christ from the book of Colossians. And I concur with that. I think that God's agenda is to make Jesus famous and to make Jesus the center of our affections. I think that God's desire is for us to be absolutely obsessed with and in love with Jesus. And Hebrews and Colossians are probably the two books in the New Testament that do that, uh, you know, the clearest. And also, if you love Jesus, you'll love the book of Isaiah, because in the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah has the most Christology and the most kind of glorified Jesus out of anywhere else. So it's kind of taking a long way around talking because we're talking about just the basics of tea. And we're pairing that with theology, the basics of theology you're going to find in Paul specifically. You're going to find in the New Testament broadly and Christology. You'll probably find in Hebrews like nowhere else. Uh, a lot of people think that Paul wrote Hebrews. I personally don't. Um, it's just my opinion, and I'll probably get to heaven, and the guy who thought Paul wrote it will get to heaven, and God will tell us we're both wrong. But um, I personally think Barnabas probably wrote the book of Hebrews. Um, if you read the epistle of Barnabas, which a lot of scholars believe was genuinely written by Barnabas, but there's good reasons why it wasn't included in the scriptures, it is formatted very similarly to Hebrews, it makes use of the Old Testament very similarly to Hebrews, which Paul does not, by the way, in his other letters, he does not use the Old Testament like uh, the writer of Hebrews does. Uh, and even the language, there's even phrases that are in the book of the epistle of Barnabas that are in Hebrews. And I, I don't know why a lot of people don't think that. And Barnabas was, a, he was a Levite, very concerned with the Levitical temple system, which is what the book of Hebrews is totally based on. Um, so I think it was probably Barnabas, but, you know, whatever. I don't know that. And whenever we get to heaven, those of us in the Barnabas line, which will be a lot shorter, we'll get to cheer whenever God says we're right. As though anyone will care when we get to heaven. But So I think it's probably Barnabas. But uh, you get 
kind of the boiled down fundamental foundational, if we're talking about the very foundations of theology, you probably get uh, the most boiled down, uh, most concise overview of the fundamentals in the book of Hebrews than anywhere else. Does anybody have a thought of where that is in the book of Hebrews? The, uh, the elemental, you know, kind of elementary foundational doctrines in the book of Hebrews. Yes, sir. Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6, absolutely. And that's actually what we're going to look at for a few minutes tonight. The foundational doctrines, the elementary doctrines in the book of Hebrews is what we're going to look at tonight. So if you would like to turn to Hebrews chapter 6, that's what we're going to uh, look at. The book of Hebrews is really... It's a fascinating book. To me, it feels so ancient whenever you read the book of Hebrews. And it paints such a picture of the sacrificial system, or, or really the whole temple system, which is fascinating to me because we know from Scripture that the whole temple system was a shadow of the actual heavenly throne room system. And so whenever you understand the whole uh, you know, ancient temple system and priestly order, you actually can start to understand the heavenly realm. And it's actually literally a shadow of the heavenly realm. The reason that the tabernacle had to be built exactly according to the, the pattern given on the mount is because it was supposed to be an earthly representation of the throne room and of the heavenly realm. And so I think whenever you read Hebrews, you get a remarkable picture of that old covenant system, but also of the heavenly realm. And I think that's why it's in Hebrews you get... I think, you know, just this, uh, I can almost see it as a painting where this entire, you know, temple system is painted and right in the middle there is an open door through the temple system right into the very throne room of God, right into the heavenly realm, because in Hebrews it tells us that Jesus has made for us a new and living way to enter behind the veil into the very holy of holies. It's in Hebrews that we're told we're to come boldly before the throne of grace. I think these are literal. I don't think they're figurative. I think that there is actually a pathway that has been opened to us, and we have an invitation to come into the very throne room of God, into his presence. Sometimes that happens, you know, by faith, whenever we're in prayer with our eyes closed, and I think other times it happens experientially where we're actually permitted to step into another realm and encounter that heavenly world. And I think Jesus has made that possible by his blood because he's the fulfillment of what the blood of bulls and goats were pointing towards all along. He's the fulfillment of the high priest who could go in once a year to the very presence of God. He became the priest who offered himself, who opened the way for all of us to go in day after day, you know, fully, uh, you know, at will, whenever we want to. We have an invitation to do that. And so anyway, Hebrews is absolutely incredible. There's some unique things in Hebrews. There's a lot of warning in Hebrews about not falling away or not turning back. We are not of those who draw back unto perdition. And there's, there's warnings about, you know, do not turn away. And so kind of in the midst of these warnings, there is this, uh, this kind of parentheses that lays out the, sort of the heart of the Christian belief system, the elementary doctrines uh, which are called foundational doctrines. And I don't believe that these are elementary as in they are the things that you learn and then you move on from and you just kind of leave behind because you don't need them anymore. If you think about what you learned in elementary school, those were the foundational things that enable you to live day to day. And if you didn't know them, you could not function, you could not operate. You never forsake them. You never move on from them. You actually build on them and strengthen them for your entire life. Everything that you learn is built upon that which is elementary. They are fundamental you know, in the most absolute sense. The word fundamental means they are foundational. It means they are the foundation that everything else is built on. You never move away from them. If you ever moved off of the foundation and started to build somewhere else, whatever you're building would collapse. You build on the foundation. You, you know, the things that are built on the foundation grow up from the foundation. And these, I think, are the core beliefs that we never move on from in the sense that we forsake them, but we build on them. You know, we, they're always our foundation that we always build on. And I think that we grow in them, which is another way of saying we build on them. We grow in them for our entire lives. 
And I think the deeper we go in them, the higher we go in them, I think that every high and deep thing of God is built upon these foundations. You know, every high thing, every deep thing, every out there wild thing in the spirit is actually accessed by these foundational doctrines. And I think that if anybody pursues the high and deep and the wild things without these foundations, then they're really setting themselves up for disaster. These are the things that we must have as our foundation. You know, this class is called Deep Foundations. That's what these Wednesday night Bible classes are called. It's because of the parable Jesus told where he said there were two men who built houses, one who built on the sand, and when the wind and the waves came, his house fell. But there was another man who dug down deep until he hit bedrock. And he built on the rock because he had dug down deep. And because he had a good foundation, whenever the wind and the waves came, his house stood. And so these are these foundational bedrock things that we build on so that when the wind and the waves come, our house will stand. And so these are those foundational things. And these are things that are very deep. These are not things that you learn in kindergarten and then you move on from. All right, so let's hit these for just a few minutes. All right, so Hebrews chapter 6. Starting in verse 1, it says, Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings or baptisms, is another way it's translated, and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. So there's seven doctrines here that he mentions. There's the elementary teachings about Christ, and these are the elementary things. You know, these are the Jesus was born of a virgin. He is fully God and fully man. This is, you know, there's no other way to God except through him. There's no other name under heaven by which can, men can be saved except Jesus Christ. These are the elementary teachings about Christ. There are many, you know, great and glorious and high revelations about Christ that are not in this category of elementary but these are the things that we have to have foundationally, and they're the things, these are the non-negotiables of the faith. You know, I can have a different eschatology than someone that I'm sitting right next to, and both of us have a Christian belief. But if someone doesn't hold, you know, orthodox Christian beliefs on the virgin birth and the deity of Christ and these very foundational things, then they actually have an unchristian belief. And so these are kind of, you know, the uh, non-negotiables. The next one is repentance from dead from dead works. Now, uh, if you will, look at these as progressive. Consider these as things that someone comes into the faith through the elementary teachings about Christ, and then they progress through each of these as they grow. They're not only progressive, but that is one way that they develop, is they develop <coughs> progressively. So the elementary teachings about Christ. So we understand who Jesus is. And then we repent. You remember Mark 1.15? It's Jesus' first message that he preached. It's repent and believe in the gospel. You know, this is the, it's the message that invites someone to salvation. It's, it's the message that is often uh, cut in half and someone preaches only half of it. Either they only preach faith and there's no repentance anywhere in the message. And it's all about believe in Jesus and you can live however you want. You don't need to repent. Or it's all about repentance and someone gets beat up with a Bible over the head saying you've got to change and get cleaned up and come to God because you're a sinner and you're going to go to hell if you don't get your act straight. But it's repent and believe. That's the message. That's the true message of the gospel. It's repent and believe. That's what invites us into true salvation. And so repentance from dead works, this is a foundational doctrine. Just as we believe in Jesus, we believe who he is, and we operate out of that belief all of our days. We're relating to God based on the fact that a perfect sacrifice was made and that the Son has made a, he's reconciled us to the Father. That's foundational in, in everything that we do. I believe a lifestyle of repentance is also foundational. It's something that we, we have to have operating in our core. This is that operating system theology that has to operate daily in order for us to progress anywhere in our life in God. And so a lifestyle of repentance is important. There's actually a, a false doctrine, I think a doctrine of demons, uh, that has been popularized by some uh, teachers that would call themselves you know, grace teachers that 
there's no need for a Christian to repent. That, you know, once we have faith in Jesus, I've even heard it said that it's, a, in a, it's an affront to repent once you've put faith in Jesus because he already covered that. You know, the finished works and, you know, Jesus already covered that, so we don't need to repent. If that's true, then why would Jesus teach us as, I mean, our model prayer, he, t he tells us to ask God to forgive us, <coughs> you know, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Why would 1 John 1, 9 tell us that if we confess our sins, uh, or um, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness? Why would James 5, 6 tell us, this is obviously spoken to believers, to confess our sins one to another and pray for one another that we may be healed. Confession of sin and repentance is foundational. It's something that we never move on from. We live a lifestyle of repentance where we keep you know, short accounts with God where we stay clean before the Lord and we, uh, we do business with God whenever we need to, which for me is daily that I'm living a lifestyle of repentance. I want to have clean hands and a pure heart. I want to be someone who lives before God pure and clean, and that means a lifestyle of repentance. So this is foundational. Faith toward God. So, you know, repent and believe that, that Mark 1.15, which, by the way, was John Wesley's favorite verse because he felt it encapsulated, you know, the, the heart of everything. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's the elementary teachings about Christ. Believing in the gospel means we're believing in Jesus. Repentance from dead works, that's the repent part. And then faith, believe, repent and believe in the gospel. That's faith toward God, which is the next of these. Now, obviously, we have to have faith. We've got to believe that Jesus died for our sins and that he's the one that reconciles us. He's the only way to the Father, and that is foundational. But as we progress in God... We don't ever move on from a lifestyle of faith, uh, you know, from faith, just as we live a lifestyle of uh, repentance. I think we live a faith lifestyle. And the more we mature, we should be growing in faith. We should be living as though all things are possible with God, that with God nothing is impossible. We should be living as though we actually do, we actually are in relationship with that almighty God who's also all-knowing, who's also always with us, who also has plans for our good and for our hopeful future. And so we should be growing in faith. I mean, really, if, if the word of God is true, if we are pursuing things the way that we should, then our lives should be becoming more supernatural as we walk with God. And we should be seeing more of the miraculous. We should actually be growing in our confidence in God and our radical, audacious faith as we're, you know, growing in the Lord. Life uh, actually has a way of attacking us so that the, the farther we go along, we have less faith. You know, whenever you think about as a brand new believer, someone will believe God to do anything. I mean, raise the dead, fly over a mountain, whatever. But as we progress in God and we find out that things are actually difficult and things are actually hard and we actually wanted to be raising the dead three years down the road in the Lord and wanted to be walking through walls and multiplying food, but we you know, get the stuffing beat out of a, a few times and our natural inclination, our natural tendency is just to kind of sit back and say, well, God, that's whenever I was a young radical believer and I didn't know any better and I didn't realize that things were going to be difficult. And you look over at the fiery person who just got saved a year ago and think, well, bless their heart. I hope they enjoy it now because once they get the junk kicked out of them a few times, they're going to be, you know, whatever, bitter just like I am. I mean, <laughs> you know. But in reality, the difficult things that we walk through and the challenging things that we walk through should actually be putting us in that place yes. called poor in spirit. You know, yes. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Whenever we're poor in spirit, it positions us to receive the kingdom of God. Whenever someone is poor in spirit, it means that they know their need. To be poor in spirit is to do the Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 things where we lean not on our own resources, but we lean fully on the Lord. It's that scene at the end of the book of Song of Solomon where she's had the junk kicked out of her through the whole book. And at the end of the book, she comes up out of the wilderness leaning on her beloved. She's in that place of total confidence, of total faith. And that's how we're meant to grow in faith. And so it's a, it's a progression. You know, we live a lifestyle of repentance. We live a lifestyle of faith. The next one is baptisms. Some translations say washings. I think the proper translation is baptisms. And it is plural, 
because there are there are plural there's a multiplicity of baptisms in the scripture there is baptized into Christ there's baptized in water there's baptized in the Holy Spirit there's baptized in fire and there's others I've heard lists of you know nine or ten different baptisms these are the ones that are very clearly taught in very plain language there's at least four baptisms and I think that you're baptized into Christ at salvation but I think we can actually more fully put on Christ as we grow in him and we can more fully be in Christ <clears throat> until we're walking in everything that the book of Ephesians has to offer then we haven't fully put on Christ but there's baptized into Christ there's baptized in water which is actually a very powerful prophetic act baptism in water is not merely an outward sign of an inward reality which is how I always heard it growing up <coughs> baptism especially in the ancient church was considered a powerful prophetic act that whenever someone got baptized they would be delivered of demons they would be healed of diseases they would often get baptized in the spirit in the waters of baptism they would have you know I, I know of examples of people having serious addictions broken off their life getting baptized in water it is meant to be Romans chapter 6 you are buried with him in baptism and you are resurrected into a brand new life it's a prophetic act uh, that I think actually manifests a spiritual reality. It's not just a representation. It's a means of grace. It's actually meant to, to bring breakthrough in our life. And so baptize, being baptized in water is powerful. And I know of people, including myself, who've been baptized more than once. Whenever I was 12 and I got baptized, I don't even think I was saved yet. Pretty sure I wasn't. I sure as heck didn't understand it. Because at 19, you know, I was like in big trouble I was you know a major sinner and in, in all kinds of bondage and finally got born again and thought man I really need to get baptized so I don't think there's anything wrong with getting rebaptized, especially if we didn't understand it the first time uh, baptized in the spirit this is a very obvious uh, concurrent experience to salvation you know there's uh, there are instances in scripture one that I know of where it seems that or not concurrent but subsequent to salvation it seems that there's one instance where baptism in the Spirit was concurrent to salvation, and that's whenever Peter was preaching to the Gentiles, and the Spirit falls on them before he even got, gave them the altar call. It's like, how in the heck did they get baptized in the Spirit before they even raised their hand and said the sinner's prayer? But what happened was, is as he's preaching, God grants them faith and repentance. They hear the word, they repent, and in, inwardly they're saying, what must I do to be saved? They're saying, yes. Whatever this message about the resurrected Christ is, I say yes, and I forsake everything else and say yes to him. So they're doing repentance and faith without ever saying a word or moving from their seat. And God sees that, they're born again, and then they receive the Spirit because Peter was so anointed at that time that people could get close enough to him that his shadow would fall over them and they would be delivered of demons or healed of diseases. And so that's the only time, though, that baptism in the Spirit happens at the time of salvation that I know of all other times it's subsequent to salvation someone gets born again and sometimes very closely immediately afterwards they get baptized in the spirit sometimes days after or sometimes months or years after like that group of disciples who had only heard of John's baptism uh, that end up getting baptized in the spirit and so uh, that's baptism in the spirit do you have a comment no, or question no, oh okay <laughs> oh I know I know thank you yeah, we got four minutes left, so we're, we're trucking right along here. Um, and then baptism in fire, there's a lot of debate about what that actually is. Um, you know, I have my own thoughts about what the baptism of fire is. I, I have heard everything from an extraordinary movement of the Spirit on your life that lights you on fire with passion for Jesus and with power and all kinds of things. I've heard of it as a persecution, as an actual season of persecution that puts you through the fire where you die to yourself and you become truly Galatians 2.20 crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. There's different thoughts on that, but it's a baptism that's very clearly taught in the scriptures. Uh, the next one is laying on of hands. So, so once someone has walked through belief in Jesus, repentance, faith, baptisms, the next one is the laying on of hands. And if we're thinking progressively, you have to think for a minute about what the laying on of hands was in the New Testament. The laying on of hands in the New Testament is for healing, but it's also for something else that's very important. The laying on of hands replaces anointing with oil for releasing into a calling in the Old Testament. What I mean is in the Old Testament, whenever a king was called, 
they would have oil poured over them that would inaugurate them into their calling. The same with prophets, you know, that was the way that someone was released into their calling. But in the New Testament, someone is released into their calling by the laying on of hands. And this is a very serious, powerful, prophetic act. Paul told Timothy, whenever I laid my hands on you, you got a gift of God that has now set you up as, I believe, Timothy probably became an apostle. And so he was given his ministry by the laying on of Paul's hands. In the book of Acts, you see they would plant a church, they would raise up leaders, and then they would lay hands on those leaders to establish them as the leadership of that city. And then they would move on to the next place and you know raise up leaders, lay on hands. So the laying on of hands is the releasing into our calling. And so once we have faith in Jesus, we're living a life of repentance, we're uh, living a life of faith and growing in faith, we're you know walking out our baptisms, then we're positioned to where we can actually be released into a calling and released into a destiny. And I think that's what the laying on of hands is really all about. The next, uh, the next one is the resurrection of the dead. Now, there's a lot to this. The resurrection of the dead um, is, you know, we will literally physically one day either be caught up in the air to meet Jesus while we are alive on the earth or those who have died uh, prior to the coming of Jesus will actually be resurrected out of the grave and caught up in the air to meet him. And we will live in our resurrected bodies forever in the age to come. Now, that's an important doctrine because it's a future reality. And even though it's very bizarre, it is real. It is, you know, 100% fact that we will receive resurrected bodies. I think there's something more to it than that. And I think there's a reason why it's put very far in this progression of our life in God. I think that maturity is when we begin to live for the age to come more than we live for this life. Whenever we so set our, our sights on the age to come, we have such an eternal perspective that we're living for eternity. We're not living for today. There's a maturity that comes on our life where we will gladly lay down our life, where we'll gladly take any risk, where we'll gladly give everything that we are for the benefit of someone else. You know, where there's no such thing as fear because we're living in such a faith realm that the age to come is more real to us than this present age. And I think that whenever Hebrews right after this, it talks about a unique category of believers who have tasted the powers of the age to come. You know, those are the ones that if they fall away, they can never be renewed again to repentance. I think it's talking about it's talking about a particular category of people who have so tapped into the age to come that they're actually manifesting it in this life and in this realm. There's a whole teaching about how by the power of the Spirit we bring the age to come into this present age. That's why Jesus told us to pray that it would be on earth as it is in heaven, so on and so forth. There's really a lot to that. But I think this resurrection from the dead is where we are living in light of and we are living for the age to come and the resurrection so much that we see this life as only a vapor. You know, all flesh is but grass. This life is but a vapor that will pass away and we're living to please our king. We're fully and wholly his because this little blip on the radar screen is, is dust in the wind compared to the endless millennia of eternity that we'll actually live for. Amen. And so the resurrection of the dead, I think, is a foundational doctrine because we are endeavoring to mature to a place where we live for the resurrection even in this age. I think that's why it's further on. And then finally, eternal judgment. There's a heaven, there's a hell, and every person will go to one of those places whenever they die. You know, the, the capstone, the culmination of our faith and our life in God will be eternal judgment. The judgment day for the believer will be the most glorious day in all of our existence. You know, the day that we receive our reward will be the most glorious day. The day that we get to enter into our eternal reward will be absolutely glorious. And so the eternal judgment, I think, is the culmination of it's when the righteous receive their reward and the wicked receive their judgment. You know, there's been a lot of debate lately, even among believers, unfortunately, about whether there is a real hell or whether it's eternal, or whether it's figurative and all this stuff. And I've even heard it said that, you know, and I've heard this said by people who are reputable that, well, we don't know if hell is eternal or not, because the word used for eternal judgment can can mean uh, a period of time. It doesn't necessarily mean eternal, endless years. Let me tell you why that's a ridiculous argument. The word eternal judgment that they point to and say that about 
It's the exact same word for eternal life in John 3, 16. It's the exact same word. It means eternal. And even though in Greek it could mean an age or a period of time, in the scriptures, it's the, the word is used 360 some times, and it never means that in the scriptures. It always means eternal. And there's a couple other things it means, but it never means a period of time. So anyway, I think you guys are probably all on board that there is a real hell, that it's eternal, that it's a real place of judgment. And if people don't know Jesus, they don't repent, they don't live in faith, they're not baptized, so on and so forth, then they're not going to the eternal reward place. They're going to the eternal judgment place. So these are the fundamental doctrines. I think they're the foundation that everything else is built on. I think they're things we never move on from. I think they're things that can be a core and a center that we live out of our entire lives. You can't go too deep in the studies of who Jesus is. I mean, you just can't go too deep in that. So, Father, thank you so much for every one of these. God, I pray that you would take us on a journey together these next five weeks, that we'd be able to go deeper in our revelation of who you are, that we'd go higher in our experience of who you are and of the kingdom of God. And, uh, Lord, bless us as we grow together and drink tea together. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Feel free to take any of this with you. Uh, there's a whole pot of black tea here. Um, and I think that's about it. See you later.